Okay. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll read these later, okay, buddy? Okay. Um, there are two watching. Um, I will wait for a little bit um, so that more people from my class can log on. Three people. I think Banji. Mm -hmm. I think Stan. All right, so um, just as folks are signing on, uh, I do want to make sure I'm very clear that uh, this is for my, my uh, class at, at Kent State University about game design so if folks are um are watching who are just subscribers uh you know please note that you know if i'm asking questions and stuff like that i'm i'm, I'm uh, trying to get responses out of my students so uh just fyi you know you're welcome to watch but uh also please uh i have to give i have to give priority to uh my student viewers uh, because they are they are here to learn about doing this crazy thing we call game design. <clears throat> so, um, let's see, we have five watching. Oh. Man, a uh, slow day. Uh, folks getting on. You know, usually we're. I'll wait like another minute or two, and then we can uh, we can get started. Oh. Okay, six watching. Thank you for the thumbs up, somebody. The like, that that's very nice. Okay. I'm, well, I'm going to get started, um, you know, and, and folks can filter in uh, as they see wish. So hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our stream today after a bit of a hiatus while we were doing other content and, um, you know, that we usually do around this time, uh, which is also usually spring break time, but, um, you know, it was not spring break time, so you just had uh, some some you know work weeks of uh, getting projects uh, going. But <clears throat> uh, what I wanted to do today is jump back into our content uh, with something that's really relevant to what you're doing with your retro game projects. And again, if folks are popping on. Uh, because they are otherwise subscribers to my channel. Uh, I just want to clarify, this is a stream for a game design class that I teach at a university, um, so please keep that in mind. Um, you know, you're welcome to stay and, and casually watch, but I am asking, I am going to be asking questions and I'm going to want answers from my students um, 
so you know please please give them priority um, on the stream but um, so we're going to be talking about you know level design today and usually uh, at least according to the syllabus, uh, you know, I do one talk on level design, but because of the nature of this semester, uh, we've ended up being able to do two, uh, which is kind of nice. But uh, to recap what we talked about last time, you know, we, we talked about what is, um, first of all, we talked about what is level design and, and, you know, how to think about level design as a professional level designer. Um, you know, we talked about like what level design isn't, things like environment art or just kind of like piling on stuff. Um, we talked about definitions of level design that people have, including myself. Uh, and then we talked about the level design process, things like gray boxing and testing and prototyping, because this is, after all, the game prototyping class. Um, we talked about why levels exist and what we're trying to accomplish with them, and that levels are not just uh, functional, they are also, you know, should be usable and navigable, but then they should also, um, you know, make people happy and, and create a, a worthwhile experience of playing the game. Um, and then, do, 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 do. Um, we also talked about uh, some tools for level design, including, you know, diagramming methods and how we base levels on movement capabilities of characters. Um, again, what the process looks like. Uh, and then we talked about, you know, how to, to plan for levels. Uh, there's more process stuff. Uh, when environment art gets thrown in, things like that. So the, that's, you know, last time was kind of an overview. And uh, before we get going, you know, does anybody, now that you've done some level design, again, I'm, I'm talking to my students uh, that are watching, you know, what, what, what experiences, what questions, what revelations do you have about the level design process now that you've done some of it in a more formal setting? Uh, what are some things that you know now that you maybe didn't know before or didn't experience before? There's always that dead air while there's a lag between the time I say something and when there's content in the chat. Um. Anybody? Things you didn't know about level design before you had to do some. It's tricky to figure out how to design a level, yeah, I'd agree with that. And, and again, that's kind of why, <coughs> you know, we talked a lot about planning methods because it is hard to sit down in, in, a, in an engine and just be like oh go ahead make make the world of the game that is the front line of how a game a, a player will experience your world right that can be kind of intimidating so um, you know our graphing methods our uh, planning methods you know focusing on things like a core mechanic of the level that can be um, that, that alleviates that. That alleviates the, oh yeah, just come up with the world, right? Uh, how to take an area and make it both functional as part of the gameplay and interesting as an overall part of the game. Yeah, that, that's a tough balance. Usefulness of sketching things out before even starting a gray box. The gray box offers a better sense of environment to which we can decide to add or remove. Yeah. Um, so to the, the comment real quick about uh, how to take an area and make it both functional and interesting, you know, one thing that's really, and, and why 
a level design talk fits in this course, which is a course game prototyping, is, you know, we, as game designers, we don't have to have all the answers. Um, and this is something that, like, new game designers don't often realize, is that we, we're not responsible ha for having all the answers. Um, more often than not, we actually are relying heavily on testers. You know, we'll make something. I'm not saying it's something perfect. It's something. It exists. You know, you make something that merely has to exist. Put it in front of somebody, and then that somebody can kind of, you know, by their reaction to it, they that lets you know whether or not you're on the right track, um, and and or whether or not you have to go back to the drawing board and fix things. So that's really you know, again, the pressure is not all on you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a lot more complicated than just creating puzzles and obstacles. Yeah, um, you know, when you're a game designer, you hear a lot of, oh, can't you just, you know, just like make it? No, no, I can't. Um, you know, and, um, you know, you're, you're, when you actually get your hands into it, you realize that's, that's the case. Sometimes tricky to figure out how to fit art into the spaces you've created, while gray boxing as well. Um, and that actually is a very important thing we're gonna discuss today, is you know when do you put in that environment art? And guess what, it's not while you're gray boxing, it should be well after. Your environment art should actually just be like, you know, hey, I've gray boxed this level, can you make it nice, look nice, Mr. Mr. or Miss Environment Artist person? Um, so uh, yeah, let's get going on this one. Now this is gonna um, this is a more advanced, uh, more theoretical uh, slideshow that I give, and I, I, we may not get through all of it. I'm gonna try my best, but we may not get through all of it. But we're gonna get to some juicy stuff here. Um, so just for uh, sake of clarification, a lot of this is from this book. An architectural approach to level design, um, which you know I wrote. Um, so you know if you find this interesting, uh, go check it out, uh, or also go check out some of the books that I'm going to name drop throughout this because um, what what we're looking at in this session today, in particular, is <clears throat> the way that humans view space. So for a long time, people were like, well, you know, you can't write about level design because level design changes from game to game. And that's partially true. Um, you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing to say that there is one core unifying theory of level design because what often happens is that every time you make a game, it's going to feel like you're designing in different ways. Um, but there are things that we can kind of hold on to uh, in terms of how humans process information, how humans um, understand space, how humans react to space based on our instincts that give us a set of guidelines into how we will understand the world around us and thus can understand like digital, you know, constructed worlds. Uh, once you have finished a gray box, translating that to final level can have its own challenges. Yes, indeed. Um, so, you know, and, and what I like about focusing on architecture uh, beyond it, you know, being my background, uh, so it, it comes naturally to me, um, but what I like about focusing on architecture as a theory of design in, in games and in game levels is that, um, you know, a lot of times, like what you have with folks who are talking about theory in game design is the way, like, oh, theory, blah. Um, and they're thinking about, you know, like game studies theory of games where, you know, it's like, you know, the role of play in society and, and stuff like that that's very high level and very distant from the game development process. And I'm not, I'm not knocking those things. Those things have their place. Um, but I'm, I'm very much because, again, I'm a designer and I'm a game developer and I'm also a, uh, you know, come from a design background. 
um, <clears throat> design theory tends to be very practical, you know, and, and this is all to say that like, you know, yes, I can talk your ear off about how um, different approaches to urban planning can, can you know, have interse uh, intersections with the way like a society is structured. But even then, um, you can really see the links in like very obvious designerly ways um, that are less abstract. It's like, you know, if you put the houses away from the businesses, then you're not going to get a lot of people doing, you know, like, and you're not using mixed use, you're not going to have people walking around and having nice full neighborhoods and things like that. Um, so so even even at its most abstract um, and sociological, um, you know, with design, there is always something practical, you know, and, and that's what I really love about, um, you know, about design theory, especially like architecture, because uh, at the end of the day, the building has got to stand up. There's, there's kind of a, a bottom line to it. And, um, you know, that, that's what I appreciate about doing this is that, you know, the humans that we work with, uh, are the bottom line. So, um, this gets into this, this concept that is, it's been buzzwordified and commodified and I don't like that <laughs> because when I was introduced to it before it was cool, um, it was a really useful idea, which is this idea of design thinking, which is synthesizing disparate bodies of knowledge into a single product or solution, or at least that's how we talked about it uh, back in the day. And you've seen this quote before, but I'm going to use it again. Um, and, you know, it really sums the whole thing up to me. Is, you know, my professor saying that his favorite thing about being an architect was if he was working on a hospital, he gets to learn about doctors and what they do and how to make their day or their work easier with the space they construct. And, and that's, again... Um, very much like our role as the game designer. It's our job to think about the, the player and think and become an advocate for the player. Now, there's limitations on this, I'm not gonna lie. You know, there's, and this is where the can't you jests um, come in, where, you know, sometimes there are things where it's like, well, I don't understand why you can't just, you know, put Mario in your game. I was like, that's because Nintendo owns Mario and we can't do that. Um, you know, things like that, but at the, you know, on, at the same time, like our job is to make a good experience for our players. We're, we're there to take what, you know, budget we have and what, um, you know, th work we are able to do, uh, within the limitations of the production and, and try to, you know, come up with something that people would really find enjoyable. And, um, you know, that's really important. And it is that sort of like, let's, let's think about the person using the, the thing we're creating, the work of design we're creating and make something nice for them. Um, so let's talk about that buzzword version real quick um, because I think there actually is some good stuff in it. So Stanford University created this, again, buzzwordified version. Um, it describes empathy as a part of the design process and that's really cool. Uh, when we think about that version of this, that relies on thinking about the player and being the advocate for the player and the user. Um, so we are, you know, we want to learn what the users and the players want and what they, uh, you know, we play test, we listen to people's feedback. Um, again, you're not going to be able to put everything in there. I just realized that this slide uh, image spelled prototype wrong. Huh. Um, but you know, you, you approach that with some element of empathy. You know, you want to think about the person. You're just, you're not just making this monolith, um, to be, you know, enjoyed by no one, uh, or for its own sake, you're making something that people use. And then the rest of it, you know, let's look at the rest of these tiles here. We have define the problem at hand, come up with ideas, of how you might address the problem, create a prototype, a prototype of how, um, you know, of your idea to address the problem or the design issue. And then you test, you, you verify whether or not that prototype um, actually is good. And then, you know, after you test, you go back and you 
define again and I you know and you kind of go through this loop what is that what does that sound like you know folks who've been in the class all semester you know we define our problem and I am looking for a, a response here but <clears throat> you know we define our problem we come up with ideas of how to address the problem we create a prototype for one of our ideas we test we go back yeah what you've been doing so far this is the entire basis of the course so you know design thinking by by you know this definition also is like listen to the user and then do scrum and you know that's how our class is is essentially structured is, is like a series of scrum exercises which if you recall is you know sort of like let's take a feature let's figure out the feature let's I uh, you know, iterate on it and then release the feature. Yeah, iterations, exactly. So, um, yeah, it's it's empathy than Scrum. And again, you know, for level design, this is really important because, like Jay Wilbur said, level design is where the rubber hits the road. John Romero, largely responsible for the impl implementation of gameplay in a title. Level design is the front line of your game. It is even more so if you are making a war game where the character is on the front line. Um, but in all seriousness, you know, you are making a game, you are making the part of the game that the player directly interacts with. Good level design can't save a bad game, but it can help. Um, you know, and bad level design can ruin an otherwise stellar game. Uh, so, you know, it's really important to have really... Uh, to make that level design sing and express the me uh, mechanics as well as you can. So we've talked about some of this um, thoughtful execution of gameplay into game space in level design. Uh, it's also our primary means of communicating with the player. I'm going to skip over these triangle, uh, the slides. We've already discussed some of this in our previous lecture. But again, um, you know, it, it's not just functional. It's not just that you 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 know did the software well. Um, you also want it to be navigable and nice and, and make, you know, people have an emotional response. <clears throat> so that, that kind of goes over some of the stuff we've talked about before, but let's talk about, um, you know, the, the types of, uh, game spaces that we can use and how that can affect the experience of space, um, and what it actually might mean to create some of this delight. Let's talk about that. So here we have a, a meme that I'm rather fond of from several years ago that talks about level design and it says like wow back in the 1990s look at what a level design what a, what a level map was like in a game like Doom uh, and look at boy look at what level design is now um, and you know I mean you can make arguments of why this may or may not be the case depending on which game and genre you're talking about um, but the illustration is useful in talking about like why exactly do people like certain levels and a big thing that comes up again and again and again and again is choice and you know even in games where there is no choice and, I, and I'm gonna use my favorite example of this which is a uh, you know old school Final Fantasy games which are very linear but the game gives you the illusion of choice by giving you small um, small level choices to make. So like, you know, if you want to explore an area a little more, you know, you might get a, a, a you know, reward for it, like a nice piece, like a piece of Phoenix Down or, you know, a, a, you know Final Fantasy VII, like a piece of Materia or something like that. So you have some branching and some side quests but it's usually within like a chunk of area and then when you leave that chunk of area you go through the story you know you can't like decide to ignore the main story the game doesn't move forward until you hit the main story um, so it's very you know it reinforces linearity but gives you the illusion of choice um, some games just don't give you the illusion of choice at all and you know small choices um, 
can have a big impact on player perception. So, so here's an example of a level prototype with choices uh, from about a year ago that I did. Um, with a, you know, if you want a, a really chaotic play tester, try try making a level for a baby sometime. Um, so here we have a level, and the beginning of the level <clears throat> is one in which. Uh, the player is drawn to a high point from which they can see the rest of the level in front of them. Uh, now, why are they drawn to the high point? Well, you know, high points tend to attract uh, players. You know, players will want to climb up to high points. And, you know, you can also help that by putting, uh, as I did, a reward at the top of the high point, which was, you know, a fun noise-making toy. But... Uh, at the top of that high point, the player gets to see a few different things. They get to see in the distance there's a little town, and, and that town has like something fun in it, the little keyboard. It's a music town. Um, they can see some of their enemies from up above, like, okay, so I have to figure out, do I want to go fight the enemy? Do I want to go straight to the town? Which way do I want to go? And then they can see their next goal. So, like, you know, the little keyboard, that's a, that's a pretty cool... That's a pretty cool reward. I like the keyboard, but ooh, the noise-making game controller. That's that's the good stuff. That's that's you know um, that's the favorite toy. So I can see that on the you know high point in the distance. So you know we have we're using rewards as a kind of breadcrumb uh, and putting some stuff in between. So we have a long-term goal, which is get to the high-value toy item. But along the way, there's some other fun and interesting things to do. So the player climbs down from the tall tower and has a choice immediately. They can go to the right, they can go to the left. There's not a whole lot of difference in either route, but you know what? It's a choice. And you know maybe the one puts you a little closer to the enemy. Um, you know, so maybe there is a tactical choice there. Um, but the point being is that, <clears throat> you know, the, the way this level worked out is that, you know, my, my son here uh, pretty clearly just wanted to go for his, his, you know, game controller toy. But there was stuff to do along the way, and, and that stuff makes the path more interesting. Um, not enforcing any visit to things like that makes the path, um, you know, feel like there's choice involved. Um, you know, you can imagine a scenario where, like, maybe the enemy takes a little bit out of you and you go have to visit the town, and now you've created a very different dynamic. You're using the dynamic of, like, combat and, and healing systems and things like that and NPCs to suddenly create a more full experience if it was just like a breadcrumb of, of rewards, right? And that's how level design can work. Um, you know, it's about putting points of interest along, along pathways, even if the pathway is linear. So um, we can find useful metaphors for, uh, you know, linearity and how to make spaces satisfying in classical playful space types. Uh, a maze, for example, is a navig... I mean, you know what a maze is, but we're going to use a definition of a maze, which is a navigation puzzles where, uh, puzzle where players have multiple choices of how to proceed, uh, proceed, even if there's one path to the exit. So in, in a lot of mazes, there are crossroads and, and junctions and things like that, and you make a choice, and sometimes that choice, you know, is right or wrong. Um, and just gives you a dead end or an exit, but sometimes that choice can, you know, just make the path more interesting. That that makes a maze more interesting. Um, you know, so mazes can be fulfilling even if there's like simple branching paths. There's also, but that's not to say linearity is bad automatically. You know, we just have to know how to use it. Um, so here you have a classic labyrinth. Now you're going to hear this a lot, like labyrinthian, when referring to a maze. Labyrinths and mazes are technically two different things, and here's what they are. A labyrinth is a uh, passage like this that only has one path through it. So all of these people walking this labyrinth are traveling the same path, and they will all hit all the points in the labyrinth. 
there's no choice of, of whether to take a crossroads or not. It's just one long snaking path. So why is this not boring? Why is it interesting? Well, um, and this labyrinth in particular, it's, it's in a church. Labyrinths are, in this type, are seen as valuable because they are meditative. It requires a lot of concentration to walk the pathway on the floor, and thus your attention is kind of taken away from, you know, the worries of your everyday life. You're, you're just kind of like meditating and, and concentrating. Um, and it's a quiet, it's a quiet reflective experience. So, you know, even if you are playing a game that doesn't offer a lot of choice, maybe that the game has an uh, interesting message or a really good story so that you don't mind that linearity. And that's, a, that there's value in that too. Um, so that's a different type of space that we can, we can look at. Um... So I guess, you know, what are your thoughts on, on linearity versus choice? You know, are there games that you've played that are linear, but that you found extremely satisfying? What were they and why? Like, why did you like that linear experience? Um, what are some choices that in games that have been really interesting? You know, tell me about those, you know, and it's important to reflect on this kind of stuff because... That, that gives you, as game designers, you want to reflect on the things that, that worked in games you've played. You know, some of the things that, um, you know, I've, I've, I mean, I've kind of modeled some of these on uh, <clears throat> games that I like. Oh, so Undertale is a linear game, but the pacing of the story and small side quests make it very fun. I agree. Um, yeah, I, I think Undertale is a really great example because there is literally one path, but you can, you can divert a lot. And, and it is nice when those divergences are rewarding. Um, and when a game does kind of open up the way Undertale, like, lets you sort of go back and get t quick travel between areas, um, that can be really nice as opposed to, again, like, when the game world opens up and it's not satisfying, uh, that can be a real letdown. I like uh, Fantasy Life. It had a linear story, but lots of mini side quests to keep you busy. Yeah, um... So again, like that sort of side content is is really important in these games because otherwise, like it's so, you know, it can feel very linear. Um, so giving some, uh, giving players something to do is is really vital. Um, there's a uh, so in like Hollow Knight, one thing that I really appreciated was that once it does, you know, it's it's linear for a while, but then once it does give you this like sort of main quest of the game the quest is not given to you and like you will eventually get this one thing it's given to you in terms of like you have to go find these three things and we're going to mark these three things on the map and you can uh, you can go after them in any order you want and they are in three like sort of divergent places but that idea of giving three things to do rather than one thing to do next is really important because it is sort of like it gives you a sense of like well there's no wrong way to proceed i can go wherever i want and that's really nice majorities of rpgs are linear with focus on story but the environments leave the player constantly exploring side quests end up forcing the player to expand their exploration yeah um i wish they'd make a new one hollow knight yeah they're working on it games take time um, but yeah, they're making Silk Song. Um, horror games are linear, but it works because you focus on the situation and not having to think about doing all these other side missions. Yeah, 
horror games, yeah, they, they, if you could kind of like freely explore in the horror game, that would make it feel less horrifying because, you know, one of the, like, tightness of space um, actually works for horror because you're supposed to feel confined and that makes it scary. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, so, um, but also I want to talk about sandboxes. So sandboxes are kind of the ultimate in player choice. You can kind of do, do anything, go anywhere, but um, designing sandbox spaces can be very tough. Now, I'm also uh, talking about this in particular because I know that a lot of you uh, are probably also taking our environmental game design class, and I know that um, that comes with a project where you are making these sort of sandbox environments, so I hope this can be useful um, in those types of environment designs. But, you know, it's very easy to look at a world like this and be like, oh, it's just big and open and there's just like lots of stuff. But, you know, the way to understand how to make these games work, you know, it's not just random. Um, and actually, a lot of thought goes into how to lay these work, uh, these types of spaces out so that you are actually doing it in a way that um, guides the player while also, a, also kind of like directing them towards a series of choices. Like, you, it's almost like you're making, having the player make informed choices. And one principle that I like to lean on a lot is um, a set of principles from this book, The Image of the City by Kevin Lynch. Uh, it's an urban planning book. And in it, he talks about uh, five different spatial principles that, you know, make the city usable. And they are path, edge, district, node, and a landmark. And we're going to look at one of my favorite uh, sandbox spaces, which is the Great Plateau from The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. So here's one thing that a lot of young designers uh, struggle with, which is that um, when you make outdoor environments especially, it can be very tempting to think, well, it's just that it's outside, it's nature, nature is random. Um, you know, there are just woods and woods are random and mountains are random and trees are random. And, you know, so I'm just gonna like take my train editor and just like make some mountains. Uh, or put down some trees or something like that. But, you know, you're still dealing with designed space. And that's not to make this, this whole lecture about outdoor environments. This is just like, you know, everything when you are building a level is designed space. It's all at your, um, it's all, you know, under, you know, you are able to craft it uh, the way you need it to be to create the best experience. So um, uh, an environment like this is, is far from random. In fact, it has very carefully planned elements um, that align with Lynch's elements. Uh, so the first of, uh, of course is paths. So, you know, there are a series of literal designed pathways in this environment. Uh, trails, you know, like, spaces that are some of them are roads some of them are trails some of them are you know like the path along a cliff but they're sort of like laid out in a way that it makes it very obvious like you can follow this trail um so that that's helpful number one is like even implied trails can be very nice and that that can be done with like your environment artwork um but then you have edges now what are edges uh, so edges are where one type of space and another type of space uh, begins and ends. And we're going to see in a second a concept called a district. Um, but right now, we're going to focus on the edges. So like when you're traveling along a path and suddenly the, the, um, the trees are very thick around you and you know maybe the music changes or maybe there's a different atmospheric effect or more fog or you know something like that you would probably say hey i'm now in the forest so that edge between forest and prairie or mountain and river or um ruins and field you know that is very important to signify to you that you have entered a new space and but 
also, you know, recognizing those edges is an important way to like navigate and be like, okay, over there's the forest, over there are the ruins, over there is the mountain. Um, you know, so that lets you get your sense of bearings. There's also a thing called a node which can be a crossroad. It can be, um, if you're looking at a game like Skyrim, which is like an even bigger scale uh, world, it can be like a city with multiple roads out of it going to different points of interest. Um, but the point is that there's usually some like decision point where you say, do I want to go that way or that way? Um, and like I said, sometimes that is just a literal crossroad, but maybe sometimes there's a landmark there or you know some resource or something like that. so it becomes almost like a little home base but nodes are really important because that is your sort of like decision points and see here um, in Zelda the decision points are like you know kind of centrally located so that you can branch off to the different parts of the plateau from the decision points um, then you have districts which are you know the different um, areas with like different themes, we'll call it. Um, so in, in a game like Zelda, you have like the forest part of the plateau, the mountain part of the plateau, the lake part of the plateau, you know, the prairie part, the ruins part, you know, the little like ruined castle, like temple of time town. That's a, that's a distinct district. But what this means is that, you know, when you're in the forest, you're like, I am in the forest. You, you start to understand the space by like the forest is north the mountain is southwest etc etc um and you know to use a more like another example of a city if you're ever making a city environment um you know if you're playing marvel's spider-man um you know that those games do a really good job of like harlem has one type of architecture midtown has another type of architecture central park is central park um you know, and that's the distinct character of these spaces allow you to understand uh, and kind of wayfind without having to always be looking at your map. That's what this is really about, is like making the space as understandable as possible in and of itself. Um, you know, and that's not to say you can't put the map in and have it on the screen and have radar and all that other stuff, but it's like another level of information. This is all about information uh, providing. And then lastly, we have um, we have uh, landmarks, which are you know things that draw the player to them: the temple, the tower, um, the the billowing cloud of smoke rising up from the town, um, you know, the town thing like points of interest. Um, not only are these places that you can see from a distance that guide you to around the map, um, but they also become goals. Again, it's like seeing that that you know noise making game controller from a distance. That's like okay, that's my next landmark. That's my next goal. And in um, in level design, people call landmarks that you can see from a distance uh, architectural weenies, meaning that um, so it's based on a term coined by Walt Disney. He would call uh, you know things like cinderella or sleeping beauty's castle in disneyland or in disney world like the magic kingdom uh, architectural weenies because they were ways for people to like see landmarks from a distance and say oh i want to go there um but it's also like if you are on one side of cinderella's castle at disney world you know you kind of know like where you are in disney world because you're like oh i'm north of the castle because i'm seeing it from this angle um he, you know, and if you're like, oh, it's funny that he called it a weenie um, because somebody did just say he, 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 he in the, uh, in the chat. The term comes from uh, when they were on sound stages filming movies and they needed dogs to run across the stage for a shot. They would take hot dogs and like lure the dogs with the hot dog, uh, with some hot dogs. And so they, that's where weenies came from. It's like, oh, we're going to make people move to these points of interest um with architecture so they were called architectural weenies architects called them landmarks um both are accepted in the industry uh so i don't know any any yeah uh you know so so many elegant um best thing i've learned <laughs> yeah no it's um 
that's a very like popular aspect. But if you do think about like, you know, think about any uh, Ubisoft open world game, like you know, Far Cry games. Like you always have to climb a tower of some kind. And that tower lets you see the world around you, sees the, lets you see the other towers. Um, Breath of the Wild has towers. And, you know, so those are actually, like, very, very literal. Um, those are, like, very standout examples of, like, architectural weenies. Um, which are almost, like, too on the nose. Some people say, like, oh, that's really on the nose. But uh, they work. They're effective. Um, so... Next thing, uh, let's talk about arrivals. Now, arrivals are really important. Um, they're the experience of reaching an important gameplay space. And we'll talk about some like aspects of arrivals here in a, in, for a little while here. Um, but know this, first of all. In a level, there is, or in architecture too, there are, uh, there's this concept of served space, which is like your important spaces. So in your house, think of like, you know, or apartment, like there's my living room, there's my kitchen, you know, there's my, my bedroom, you know, that's, those are important spaces in a house. Um, in a game, served space is any space that really like focuses on the core mechanics. So this, in this Doom Deathmatch map, um, any served space is like, a little you know room of this environment where you are going to be you know doing your fighting doing the the primary uh elements of your fighting so everything else which is like you know think in your house your hallways your entryway things like that um they are just spaces that kind of like funnel people to the good parts um, so that's service spaces. Now that in a video game map, that's not to say you can't like do some fighting in the or have some interesting encounters in these service spaces. But you know the the served spaces, these bigger areas that I've highlighted in pink, are the ones that are really decked out to like make interesting combat encounters. They have all the verticality. They you know like multiple levels within a space, things like that. Um, you know points to snipe from. You know lots. They are more jam-packed with, with potential content and potential encounters than, you know, just like the straight hall, uh, the, the kind of squiggly hallways you see on the sides and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so how do we make spaces interesting? Well, first of all, let's talk about environment art. So it's easy to think of environment art. Um, so first of all, like, I guess young designers, one of the things that they do a lot is they will start putting environment art on their level as soon as possible. And you don't want to do that because environment art is often very complex. It often has a lot of little pieces. Um, and if you design a level with your finalized environment art and the level is not very usable or fun or interesting or doesn't elicit the type of emotional response you want, you suddenly have to take it apart by taking out lots of lots of little pieces instead of taking out like really big pieces um, that are easy to delete very quickly. So, um, but that's not to say that you can't have any artistic aspects at all. In fact, art, art um, in video games does not just serve as a nice skin for your gameplay. And that's, this is a thing that a lot of, that some designers don't get um, to the point where I actually get very annoyed with some people um, who are like, oh, well, visuals don't matter. I've actually, um, I was, my name was added to a paper that made that argument once, and I was not happy with it because I actually very often argue the opposite. Um, you know, the visuals and the environment and the artwork of a game add greatly to its experience. Um, not only in like the visuals are nice and it has nice graphics um, but also in terms of you know how we can use environment art as a means of communicating with a player so here's an example um, so obviously this is you know well obviously for the folks in this class um, but you know this is from the game god of war uh the most recent god of war but what what is it that we're looking at in this? Um, 
you know, it's a puzzle. And what do you suppose is up with that red thing? You know, what... Uh, and, and, you know, so I'm going to try to ask it in a way that doesn't assume that you've played God of War. Um, but when you see a red thing in the environment in a game, what does that usually mean? I guess is the right way to answer, uh, ask this. It's interactive, yes. Um, that's a very nice way of putting it too, because like I was, yes, it is interactive. Um, one might even say, oh, enemy, yeah, there you go, destructible. Somebody even said destructible. Um, yeah, so oftentimes when you see a red thing in an environment in a video game, um, it is destructible. <clears throat> you know, but that's even like itself kind of inside game knowledge, and I'm using that because we are in a game design class, and I know that my students in particular um, you know, this group of students are very game savvy. But yeah, generally, having something stand out like that is some signifier that it is interactive. Um, and then often, you know, in games based on combat, if it's red, it, it blows up. Which is the case here. If you have, um, if you shoot the, the red thing with lightning, it blows up, and then it knocks down, so there's that tunnel there, um, that would be covered with an ice wall, and it would not, you know, destroy the ice wall. So there's a whole puzzle based based around like this red stone. It's it's eventually like when you know when it gets environment art, it'll be this like shiny red jewel. Um, but red stone in the game has the context of being exploding stone that if you again hit it with lightning, it blows up. Um, and there's this puzzle where you like move a giant's ring there's the dead giant and then you like move his ring so that the redstone is next to the the wall that you want to blow up and you you know hit the redstone so that's what this is it's a gray box of this puzzle um but see we're still using color to you know play at this idea of like games have these accepted tropes of signifiers right um, and even if you are playing with somebody who's never played a video game before, um, you know, the game might even had something like, oh, you know, blow up the redstone or something like that. And, and But we're still using color and visual communication to signify, like, here is the interactive thing. Um, and we can do this in our gray boxing so that we can test puzzles like this and how to make them usable and understandable without having to... Wait for somebody to do our nice concept art for the red stone and get it approved and then do all the different levels of asset generation that one has to do to make an asset like that that is finalized and approved and then put into the game. You know, we don't have to do that. We can just be like, uh, red polygon. And then, boom. Uh, so, you know, that's what prototyping is about. But, um, yeah. You know, so you can use, even at the most abstract, color to signify different things in your video game. The other thing you can do is think about, you know, like lighting and, and color schemes this way. Um, so even when, when you're prototyping, you can still do a lot with aspects of the arts um, and visual communication. So one of my favorite examples of lighting use in a game is the beginning of uh, the game Bioshock Infinite, where it's a series of chambers, but the chambers change their color scheme in really clever ways uh, to draw you through the environment. So if uh, you know the chambers in this sequence are either like yellow, orange, or blue, purple in color scheme. And so if you're in a room like this, which is very yellow-orange because of the light of the candles, um, the way out is going to be blue. And, you know, that's because uh, yellow-orange, its complementary colors are the color on the opposite side of the color wheel, um, which is, you know, blue-purple area. And that does two things. One, that creates a cool color scheme because, like, blue-orange is a nice color scheme. Um, but it also does this thing because they're on opposite ends of the color wheel. They contrast most severely, and in doing so, 
you know, blue as the exit in an orange room is going to be the loudest indicator. Um, and that's not to say it's gaudy. It's very nice. It's very elegant. It feels very good. Um, but that that use of color theory um, makes a very nice environment without having to have some sort of hand wavy thing that's like, all right, all right, look for the orange door. Look for the orange door. You know, you don't have to do that. You can just kind of like have it be orange in the blue space. And then you're like, aha, that's where I will go next. They also do a really interesting thing with this, which is that, you know, so at one point you're in a blue violet room and the way out is that opposite color. But then there's these like side passages. And if you're like me, you love looking at the side passages and you, you don't speed run anything <laughs> ever um, because you're like looking at every nook and cranny. Um, so the side passages, because the room is mainly like blue violet you know the side passages are like red violet so it's like the next color over on the color scheme and what that does is it's another signifier but it's way more subtle but in those passages it's not the main path but like you might get some extra pickups might some extra health items or some extra change or you know a little you know, like money and stuff like that um and and that's kind of nice because it like you know you're getting rewarded um, but it uses color theory to signify like, yes, there are hidden goodies over here. They're just not in the main path. Um, so that's a really cool, like if you've, if you've uh, got that on Steam or on uh, Switch or on, you know, because Bioshock collection is now on Switch. Um, you know, if you, if you go play that, like go play that and, and take a look at that. This section in particular is really nice because there's no enemies. It's kind of a story setup section. Um, but you know, you can look at that and be like, wow, you know, observe, the, or even just like look at a Let's Play on YouTube. But you can observe how the color theory in that space works. Um, and it's really nice. And then vi visual communication can also, you know, occur in textures. Uh, visual communication is also good at telling you where in the story you are. Um, so, you know, uh, you might be aware of like the hero's journey um, where, you know, a character... Uh, leaves home to go into like a world of danger and through that you know going through danger gets a boon and and be grows and brings something back to their hometown um, but usually you can mark the passage in a in a story like that through like the quality of the environment around them and the um you know the the nature in a game the nature of the textures like if you're in the uh bright happy grass area you're probably in the beginning of the story um you know the final final uh battle with the bad guy rarely takes place in a uh, pleasant field of flowers except that one or two times um you know but those are actually really cool so you know but typical tropey fashion you're usually going to have like the bright nature associated textures with uh, happier, easier levels. And then you're going to descend into sort of like more ruined man-made stuff uh, as you, as you progress. So I don't know. What do you think? What do you think about that in terms of like use of environment art as, as visual indicator, um, even at the gray box level? Um, you know, do you ever find yourself struggling with knowing when to um, to add environment art uh, and, and what questions do you have about that? Lava always means boss fight. There you go. That's a good indicator. You know, for example, like I, um, it's definitely important, especially with lighting comes to a 3D level. Yeah, lighting is something that you can add. You don't have to wait until like the environment art's done. You can just add lighting, but lighting can do so much um, to, to build a sense of atmosphere. And sometimes that atmosphere is actually an important part of your gray boxing because you do want to, 
then you can start to get to like what emotion does this level make you feel you know and it, there are times i will say there are times when you you will be able to build your environment art and your level massing together but you know that's not always the case you know like for example my current game we happen to have a system that lets us do this type of thing um, with our environment art, but that's also because we are making a game that supports this type of thing. Um, you know, making these level masses that just happen to be made out of cool art. Um, you're not always going to have that luxury. So learning how to get the most out of your gray boxes, um, even without the finalized art, can be really important. Enemies usually mean you're moving the right way. Um, yeah, it's like that old meme of, of uh, you know, um, I think it's a picture of Gandalf. It's like, you know, so one of the pictures from Lord of the Rings and the text is like, they are coming when you reach a place that has like a save point and a bunch of health pickups. You know, something's about to go down. Um, and, and, you know, there are signifiers like that in games. It's not to say you always have to follow those rules. You can subvert things for sure. But... Um, you know, yeah, I've I've played a few levels recently that even in like high profile games where I was like, why is the main why is the next part of the main path so seemingly tucked away? It's like, oh, I found a secret. No, that's that's the main path. What is this level designer doing? Um, you know, navigation is important. Large empty space, music stops, linear path to the room, definitely impossible. Um. So, real quick, uh, let's talk about the miniature garden. Climbable ledges count, I call it pigeon, uh, uh, um, do climbable ledges count? Yeah, um, and actually, you know, it's funny, you're talking about the colorization. Um, some games do it as white. I see a lot of games do it as yellow, but yellow has become like some of, one of the de facto, like you can climb this colors. Uh, which actually makes me really appreciate Breath of the Wild because I, I, I played a Horizon Zero Dawn and I love that game, but I also played it immediately after finishing Breath of the Wild. So I would always go up to like any mountain, any hill and be like, why can't I climb it? It's like, oh, I got to go find the yellow. Um, but yeah, but you know, I mean, that's a good point that you, we have adopted certain colors to denote interactivity um so those are useful and again like you know you have the environment art where the yellow edges are spray painted or something but you know you could easily do that in gray box and just have yellow massing um okay so we're going to talk really quickly about another concept which is really useful which is called the miniature garden which is the idea of a small space such as a garden mimicking a much larger landscape. So this is kind of like a high level game environment design item, but it actually starts to talk about how we use environment art in a game space. So a little bit of local interest here, Cleveland Botanical Garden by David Slauson, who is a uh, Japanese garden designer, uh, a designer of Japanese style gardens. And um, <clears throat> he studied in Japan under a uh, master gardener in the art of Japanese garden design. And w one thing that makes Japanese gardens unique is that they are um, certain types of Japanese gardens, because uh, there's a few different types, but certain types of Japanese gardens um, are made to look like different types of landscapes. Uh, much larger landscapes and for example you know you look at this garden you're like oh that's a nice lawn with a rock and some bushes but you are, you're also kind of meant to understand this garden as a uh, as a lake you know where the surface of the quote-unquote water uh, you know liberal use of air quotes here um, is the grass and then out in the middle of the grass or this lake is an island. The island has a cliff and it has a small forest of trees around it. Um, 
And, and they create this effect with boulders and bushes that resemble tree-like shapes, you know, bonsai trees and things like that. And then, you know, it kind of goes off into the distance with, like, differing levels of, of hills and bushes and trees and forests, you know, mimicking uh, cliff or, you know, bushes mimicking trees and forests and uh, rocks mimicking cliffs and things like that. So if you kind of, you know, allow yourself, you can see this as actually, like, almost like a painting of a, of a landscape. It just happens to be done in elements of a garden. So why do we care? Well, this is like the entire thing we do with environment design in video games. And the principles of Japanese garden design are actually really important in how we draw attention to points of interest in games. You know, and if we think about like, you know, those architectural weenies and those landmarks, as so if we go back to this you'll notice in the um in the little island in the center where there's that boulder there's a really tall rock now that we could see that if we're looking at that as sort of like the focal point of that little patch so if we look here what's our focal point What's the focal point of this image? So like our player character is that, um, so I, I actually did this drawing in 2013. Um, and I was actually thinking way more about like Hyperlight Drifter, uh, but it also ended up being like, wow, very Breath of the Wild-ish. Big tower in the back, yeah. So that's our focal point. That's our architectural weenie. That's the, the point of this view. So then how do we... Because like we could theoretically have this be the entire view, but what is helping draw the eye to this tower? What's helping us draw the eye to this tower? And I've kind of labeled it all for you, but you know what is it about this composition that draws the eye to that tower? And I should clarify before somebody says, well, the tower's tall. Um, what about the composition of thing? Hey, there you go. The rocks all pointing toward it. Because remember, nature in video games is not nature. It's not random. We control it. It's just architecture. And so we can have rocks sloping and pointing towards something. And in, when you do a Japanese-style garden, when you do uh, rock formations in particular, what you do is you lay down the tallest rock first, and then you lay down the rocks that are not quite as tall as it, next to it next. You basically go from like tallest to shortest. And in doing so, you start to create a composition where the stones around the tallest object um, or the elements around the tallest object will complement that tall main focal object. Um, so here you actually have, you know, the horizontal force of the field in front of you that draws your eye across it. The vertical force creates that focal point. And then, um, and, and they actually refer to these things as having forces, but they're like visual forces. All the rocks around it, like you've all pointed out, are pointing towards um, this this uh, you know uh, this you know main focal point. I also use something uh, the sort of triad formation, um, which is actually like putting thing in a little triangle of threes that also points you at things. Now I, I mentioned that I um, I drew this in 2013, but then look what happened in in 2017. This game came out. More Breath of the Wild. More more Chris fanboying about this amazing game. But look at this. Okay, so we've got our our main points of interest. We've got Hyrule Castle, Death Mountain, and Zora's Domain. From the top of the cliff at the like the very first part of the game, um, and then elements in this first part of the game have forces that guide your eye towards these top points. But it goes even beyond that. You also have cliffs and features next to these that 
point that are like right next to them that point directly up to them. So, you know, you see how environment art is laid out in very specific ways to guide the player's eye where it wants to go. You know, like, and yeah, Death Mountain with its cloud of smoke and its lava and the glow coming from it. Um, Hyrule Castle with its, like, you know, sharp towers and, and things like that and it being this piece of architecture in a natural world. You're pro And also, you know, giant demon cloud flowing around it, um, usually in this game. Um, those are going to draw your attention anyway, but, but um, you know, the way that the world is constructed in general, like, really calls your attention to it even more so. And what that does is it, like, gives you a very clear idea of here are where your goals are when you are playing a game. Because that's really what it is. It's you want the player to know where they are supposed to go. This is the environment designer saying you can go there, there, or there. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is contrast. And contrast uh, can happen a lot in video games, but contrast is one of our most important tools. We can talk about, uh, so spatial identity, spatial like feeling and, and type, uh, spatial size is a really uh, good, good starting point to talk about contrast. So in games, we have narrow spaces. Uh, narrow spaces are spaces where like the player cannot move around very easily and I like to think of the hallways in the original Resident Evil um, and you know the the tank controls the bad tank controls notwithstanding um, you know you can't really move around a whole lot you know if you're in a in a hall in a narrow hallway with a zombie it's hard to get past the zombie because of the way the hallway is constructed uh, so narrow space limits your movement intimate space is is a it's a space that's just right it's the space that um feels good within your player character's movement capabilities so like peach's castle in mario 64 mario can like within his native jumping abilities comfortably jump to everything that it feels good to be mario in this space and then you have a thing called prospect space which is just wide openness. And you'd think that that would be okay, because narrow space is the one that sounds awful, right? But prospect space is actually also kind of awful because, like, you're exposed. It's just you and the dragon, you and the boss. Um, you know, you and there's, like, guys shooting at you from above, whatever that might be. That's prospect space is when you're exposed. So one form of contrast is called Prospect and Refuge. New Tomb Raider installments use this as well with claustrophobic caverns and tunnels that go underwater. Exactly. Um, it's a really useful spatial like you know, idea. So Prospect and Refuge is where you contrast nice, intimate, like I am in charge of this type of space versus scary, exposed space. And what that does is it starts to create a sequence. You can create a linear sequence of like, you know, running from cover to cover or running from hiding spot to hiding spot or safe spot to safe spot. Um, then that can create, I mean, that's a, that's a whole level. You can do a whole level of that. Um, so, and, and often you do. Uh, so if we think about the game, a game like The Last of Us, um, you know, you go through these sequences where you're hiding behind boxes and you're kind of like trying to get from hiding spot to hiding spot. Now, you know, this is a little more dramatic, but um, you can also imagine one where maybe you're going from like, you know, through high intensity environment to like lower intensity environment, but maybe it's like a few rooms, it's not just like a box, right? Um, or you can start to play up these contrasts between like a covered space and an exposed space, like in this real world piece of architecture, the Court of the Lions in Granada, Spain, um, where, you know, there is a real interesting dynamic between somebody who's under the covered archway uh, versus somebody who's in the open courtyard, right? That's, that's a really uh, interesting architectural sequence. Or, and somebody was saying claustrophobic caverns and other spaces, 
it's really interesting when you are in a claustrophobic environment, like in uh, Half-Life 2, Episode 2, when you're in the um, antlion den, and you're fighting through this like intense, claustrophobic, narrow um, like pit of monsters, and then you leave it, and you're in this like beautiful valley with with trees and this rewarding vista. Like the people at Valve even call this a rewarding vista, where just this nice view and the opportunity to rest for a store for a beat is the reward. And you know you get some health items and stuff too, but like and you know a cutscene, but you know to get some story, but you know having this wide open beautiful space is actually part of the reward. Um, and that contrast of like you know you approach from this narrow and then suddenly it's open and beautiful is a, a brilliant use of contrast uh, to create a cool. Um, thing and then actually it sets up the next sequence because it's like oh no the enemies are going towards our base and we can see them from down here in the valley up on the bridge and then you know you have entire maps built out of prospect and refuge um, a map like this in halo reach um, thrives on it where you know the people like that master the the uh top of the level uh have sort of like ownership of it but you know there's lots of still little refuges for people running around uh real quick one last thing with um with our contrast uh i would be remiss if i didn't talk about shadow which is light created when uh, darkness created when light is blocked you're like duh but shadow is really important because that contrast of approaching from light to dark versus dark to light Humans don't like going from light to dark in terms of lighting. It's scary. But we're level designers and we can make people be scared, so it's an important way to create emotion. Um, but it can also be satisfying, like in this example, to go from dark to light. You know, And that's actually another way to lead people through an environment is leading people from point of light to point of light to point of light. Uh, that's often used in the Last of Us games, going through houses, dark areas created uneasy with clickers and zombies. Bingo. You know, dark to light is really important. Light to dark, dark to light. Then you also get shade. And some of you were like flirting with this idea a little while ago here, um, which is like why I was like, we absolutely must get to this point. Um, shade, which is when you walk into the giant space and the light kind of looks like this and you don't know if you're like am i about to fight a boss or am i about to like get a cool sword like what's about to happen shade is that lighting condition between light and dark caused by diffused light you get it in churches it's it's used in church design classically to build a sort of like ethereal uh you know new light looks nova um you know, feeling of like being close to the heavens and, and things like that. What it does in games and what it does to our brains is make us curious. So especially if you like pair it with something like repeating columns that go off into the shaded like, you know, fogginess, that gets us kind of like wondering what's up and we follow it. Um, and again, that leads us, uh, I've heard this called atmospheric ambiguity. And that's really good because, again, you have that atmospheric ambiguity of like, am I about to get something cool and look at the, you know, shade in this environment versus here's another one with shade or, oh, no, I'm about to fight something. Um, and that's, you know, that creates a really cool uh, spatial, uh, you know, when, in, when we're talking about such sharp contrast, this actually is a really nice uh, use of, of ambiguity. Uh, between the two. So that's where I'm going to stop. Uh, any questions, comments, anything to think about? Let's end on the picture of the Master Sword because it's Q. Um, again, I know that some of you are in that level design class, so um, please feel free to, like, if there is anything you're wrestling with, 
Um, you know, now's the time to even potentially ask about that. Get all the classes like working together. So on the on the comment about The Last of Us, players always feel relief after exiting to the open environment. Yeah, and that's that's not that's not accidental. Um, and in fact, again, remember, you're in school to learn how to do that stuff. You can be the master of that. These are all tricks. Like you should you should use and abuse. Um, these are all the the tools at your disposal. Is is mastering these kind of like contrast between light and dark the lighting conditions the color of lighting the the um you know the the way that we visually communicate through our environment art this is all stuff you can do uh with the tools you have it's just it's like the next level knowledge beyond just using the tool it's like you know finding i don't know the the intelligent uh implementation of the tool uh <laughs> Character even lets out it. Yeah, I've talked about um, levels of information in game design, and you know, having the uh, environment be super readable is one level of information. Then maybe having like interface elements is two or three more levels of information, so that the player gets the message. Uh, that's quite an a uh, an emotional cue. There is to have the actual character let out a gasp, a relieved gasp. It's kind of like um, a laugh track on an old sitcom being like, you're supposed to think this is funny. Uh, that's, that's a nice, I forgot about that. Any questions? Good discussion today. I really enjoy this. You know, I love talking about level design. Um, well, if anybody thinks of any questions, I will be in the Discord. Um, also, before we uh, go, remember that um, you have only a few more days to sign up for the the uh, internship class. Uh, at least, you know, my project that I'm I'm facilitating for the internship class. Um, so, if you have any questions about that, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but also remember to get that stuff together um, because. There's only a few days left. Um, so I will talk to you all later. Uh, it's been awesome. Um, and have a good rest of your week. Bye.